Good evening and welcome to my cellar. Here we are in November. Where do we year go? Shall we? Regarding treasure, when I was learning to play in the mid-90s, my friend's father ran games for us. He was from the old school. Something instilled in me to this day is you can't just, you just, can't just go out and buy magic. There were no magic item shops. Magic items either had to be found, or if you got high enough level, the party wizard could research how to make them. If we wanted bags of gold, it was only as much as the party could carry until we could afford horses. The smarter players would use their gold to buy gems and jewelry back in town. Having an excess of gold only meant that the fighter could afford full plate. Yeah, that that I I uh, I think I embrace that I, ideology pretty thoroughly. Um, there there was no old curiosity shop that uh, happened to buy magic or sell magic for that. You know, uh, there could be. Okay, now, now let me clarify. Um, if you were in a, a mega city. You know, there there could be the possibility of curiosity shops and apothecaries and uh, s stores that dealt in all the occult and obscure items need for spells and what have you. But it had to be a, a, a megalopolis. It had to be a mega city. Um, there were other ways around it, which even could involve small side quests and, and side journeys and stuff like that. But, yeah, I, I, I embrace that idea. Um, and it was always better to convert your bulky gold into gems when you could. Uh, smart players soon realize that uh, when it comes time to dividing up the loot, they'll take their share in gems, please. Can't get gems? Well, jewelry, that's okay, too. But, you know, good old bulky gold, wow. Um, uh, a, a bracelet worth 80 gold pieces probably weighed a 40th of what that gold would have weighed in bulk. So, yeah, it was, it was a good thing to do. And, yep, yeah, you need a horse. Now, it's funny that this one mentions horses because there's another reference to horses in another question later or comment and I'm going to shoot rainbows out my ass yep can confirm this is a thing the weirdest thing about RPGs with extensive character abilities is that they actually tend to stifle creativity and agency in play by being overly defined oh you don't have plus two in horse riding that mean you can't ride a horse or by reducing the game into choosing between restrictive combat widgets and build synergy like you're playing Magic the Gathering. Good point. Good point. Needed pointing out. Uh, I agree. When you tend to only have three strings tied to your fingers, you know, these abilities, and none of them are particularly useful in a given situation, it's like all your other fingers went dead or, or deserted you or something. Whereas when you don't have those fingers holding down or being held down by strings, now you can start to think in different manners and different ways and try different things. Um, th that was always one of the great mental ooh, feelings about playing D and D in the early days. Is you could try any goddamn thing you wanted. Try it. On the off odd chance that it succeeds, whoa! A legend is born. It was all about trying, not about getting. Not about acquiring, not even so much about leveling, is trying. One of the things that I love, there's the same person goes on, one of the things that I love about old school games is to actually earn your special abilities by finding and identifying magic items and that, at least in my group, 
Who should get to equip the item is determined by group consensus. In my experience, this curbs tend this curb trends this curbs trends try saying that faster of antisocial character building and the group gets to come up with interesting strategies and adapts their gameplay in unique ways. Although it may at least be a part of having a wonderfully thoughtful, engaged, and generous group of players, mind you. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, in all the early games I played and, and encouraged and ran, it was about the party. Who could best use this uh, plus three left-handed widget uh, fastener? Who could best use it? Who hasn't gotten, you know, in the in, in the last round of halls and divvy ups, who's who's still lacking a little? You know, who's gotten the short end up to now? Okay, it goes to them. The party becomes stronger. And it goes to someone that can best utilize it. And party play is supposed to be where it's at. That's what it that's what it was about. Party play. The group succeeds. The group goes on the adventure. The group faces the hazards. The group overcomes the hazards. The group goes home. Heroes. Yay. The group achieves their goal. Yay. Not one or another. The group. And Maybe it's harder today to find a, a steady group that uh, has a steady base of players. You know, you're always going to, as I've learned in, in the last couple of years, your your groups are going to be pared down by any number of things. In my case, it's been a couple of my groups have died. Um, so um, it, it might not be a problem you're worried about if you're considerably younger than my almost 76. But um, groups turn over. For whatever reason, groups turn over. And if it's been the group all along, then the players, the player characters, become something like interchangeable. The group that I run games for in Okinawa, the Seven Winds, Every time I run a game for them, there's at least four, oftentimes five, that have played in this, played with me before, they've done this before, and uh, only two or three newbies. They get to step in, and um, it, it's never about individual, who got what, who did what. It was, did we survive? Did we get out? Group play it should be more of a focus. Um, there's not a way to rate group play or define it or grade it short of a tournament setting, but um, I think if you focus more on the group, you'd start to grade out higher. It's having fun, being tight. Niche protection is also important to us, which is kind of why I only let fighter characters use the spell-like abilities of magic weapons, if any. But the party stumbling on something as simple as a set of boots and a cape of elven kind really shakes things up. Yeah, because any of them can use them. Any of them can make an argument for it. And that's where the needs of the many have to outweigh the needs of the few. I know, Spock said it first, but the concept is predates Spock by a bunch. Um, okay, this next one. How's your weather? Down here in New Zealand, it's unusually hot for spring. Well, up here in Ohio, it's unusually warm 
for fall and going into the winter. Um, so I guess we'll just figure that climate change has changed a whole, everybody's weather is different. Okay. What are some good ways to bake in weak spots into one's monsters? Well, it's always been my belief that, and it's probably inspired by, inspired by the missing, uh, the missing uh, scale on on Smaug's chest. But I, there should always be a way to take down the monster. Go back to the Bible, little tiny stone. And the monster goes down. So I think that's been kind of a universal precept that there's always a way. And I think there should be always a way. Now, you know, it might it might be something relatively exotic. But there should be something there. Um, the boule had the pot, the spot behind its sail. Another way you can do it is um, don't have what they encounter up to full strength. You know, not every monster, monster being anything that isn't a player character, is always healthy 100% all the time. So you can make them. Nothing says that you have to make every monster the maximum hit dice. All right, and uh, we'll address that, uh, touch on that concept a little later in another one. But um, if you're going to make new monsters out of whole cloth, then either give them some physical like my sail behind on the boulet's back, or um, give, me some, give them some um, susceptibility to something odd, smoke, fire. The, the, your choices are lim, li, virtually limitless at this point. Uh, the the odor of calla lilies brings us to his use your imagination. I oftentimes when I'm populating an encounter will have um, not not everybody's fully up to snuff. That's not real. If you want verisimilitude then you have to do that too, and I'll talk about it again in a, in a minute. Um, should a monster's weak spot be a fail-safe, a way to pull the plug, so to speak, in case the party is falling hard, failing hard? No! 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 Party fails, party fails. Well, hope we learn some lessons here. Now, one thing you can do is make them like except, exceptionally susceptible to pain. Or, um, for instance, if you're battling something like an elephant type thing that's got a trunk, well, the trunk's really sensitive. That would be a weak spot. Give the monsters some brains. Not gonna sit there and fight to the death every time if they got a chance to book. Think about it. Self-preservation is on everybody's to-do list. Number one. I would never pull a plug on a monster. Uh, 
All right, what are some good ways DMs can convey the weak spots of monsters without table talk and maybe gaming? None. That's why I like using something new that they've never seen before because nobody knows what it'll do. Now, if it has a weak spot, I might, after several rounds of close run combat, point out that He's doing a very, very good job of keeping his tail away from you, his back away from you. You know, something like that that might suggest that it's protecting a soft spot or weakness. Never just come out and say it. Um, what is the best way to play this type of information? For you know, Examples, don't ask, don't tell. NPC, a son, let me tell you the story of a big bad nanny goat monster. Soft meta, as, <laughs> as the women turns, you see a big red and white striped target on its butt. No. Um, anything that appears to be unkill unkillable ought to be run away from. Unless you know how you're going to do this. And a weak spot doesn't have to be physical. Charmed by music. Bemused by moonlight. Um, any number of things that could be a pain in the ass if they happen at the wrong time. Be creative. Animal companions. Man, so tricky to use in-game. The ranger or druid wants to have a pet mountain lion. So what happens when they go into town? How do people react? Is a creature going to be able to keep its stuff together in an urban setting? Is it going to pull the turkey hanging in a butcher's stall off the wall and take it off with it? As a DM, I'm sort of torn between giving the player a break and minimizing the difficulties of trying to have a more realistic setting where people are going to panic if they see a saber-toothed tiger sauntering down the sidewalk. Well, okay. A saber-toothed familiar, I would consider to be somewhat of a stretch. Now, any of you who have ever watched any YouTube video have seen every kind of animal baby found in the wild and rescued and turns out living a happy, uneventful life with its owner, up to and including mountain lions and cheetahs and stuff. We've all seen it. What we don't see is the reports that when one of those hand-raised bears loses its shit and uh, kills the neighbor's four-year-old, who happened to wand over going, oh, pretty bear. Um, for those of you <laughs> pardon me. I shouldn't chuckle like that. I do that every time. For those of you who are old enough or have Google skills, look up Gentle Ben. Gentle Ben was about Dan, Fogr Dan Haggerty and his giant goddamn grizzly bear. There's some interesting reactions when uh, the grizzly bear interacted with the world. If you're going to give someone an animal, pet, familiar, whatever, at the time of giving it, determine things like what you want to use, stability. How mellow is this animal? How stable is its docile character? Um, its level of training. You, you, the, the player can tell you whatever he wants. You can determine just how plausible that might be. And so, having determined those types of things in advance, if you go into a crowded setting... Now you can start making rolls for the pet. 
the familiar just like you would anything else. And when it loses its shit, well, it's bad news for everybody around. Uh, I, w I, I simply wouldn't. The, the idea of a saber-toothed tiger, I no. Um, I've never, ever run a world, built a world or a campaign where I had basically dinosaurs or, in this case, saber-toothed tiger. Now, I know it's fantasy, it's fantasy. Well, still and all, if you want to have a saber-toothed tiger, I'm going to determine how far beneath the surface is the beast. And there may become an occasion when the beast is released. For instance, you go into a small village, talk to the gentle Ben, tell him it's all cool, I'll be in here, you know, whatever you and your gentle Ben buddy do. And all of a sudden, three, three, three preteen boys with sharp sticks and stones come up and start poking and, 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 and bonking the thing with rocks and you make a roll on its placidity rating or its docility rating or what, what, however, you know, its tameness rating, however you want to handle it. And if it fails, well, gentle Ben killing two or three of the little kids, you know, the young boys in the neighborhood is not going to go over well with their parents. So, hey, there's another whole side, a whole bag full of side issues you could get into. Uh, what's the idea, What? where did the idea for mana as a, as a representation for how many spells could be cast per day versus the Vancian system originate? I think quantifying power like that started with the idea that uh, spell points. You had so many spell points, every spell costs a certain number of points, and therefore you could, you know, throw spells up to the value of your points, and once you run out of spell points, you're, you're, you, got, you can't replenish right away. I, th I think the, the German, the idea took, right, took root, pardon me, took root in that concept, which I'm glad to say we squashed. But um, I've mentioned the word mana quite a bit when I speak of my world. My world has high, low, and normal mana zones on them based on stories that I, uh, you know, histories that I've written or imagined, uh, things that took place there and uh, had that effect on it. Um, but in, in my, the way I use mana is, is not just straight out spell points. And for instance, in my world, if you cast a, uh, a light spell in a low mana area, it's not going to, the light's not going to extend as far as it normally would. Or, conversely, if you were in a high mana area, didn't know that, of course, through the light spell, and it went off like a Klieg light into the sky. It's fun. It's different. It makes it unique and quirky. Those are all the things I've told myself when I was writing it. But I like it that way. With the way I deal with clerics in my setting, clerics are much more dependent upon mana or mojo or however you wish to quantify um, their fervor, their sincerity, again, wherever you want to take that. And what, the, but, I, I limit them to 
what looks suspiciously like the uh, prayer spell it called in the book spell my book my world prayer format so if uh, how I convert it is pr the prayers have power as a functioning cleric you have the ability to perform so many rites meditations how, how however you want to can't quantify it because I don't do spells. No grinding up an egg and hocus pocus. And of course you're communing with your deity, whoever or whatever that deity might be. And you your your accomplishments in your clerical studies have determined that you can do so many prayers of whatever of certain levels in a given day. Now, if we had 20 more minutes, I could give you all kinds of justifications for that. So, I read books about ley lines the way uh, the, the magic is distributed across, the energy is distributed across continents or whatever. And so a lot of that got merged and humbled, jumbled and bundled up. Um, you could take my world and just simply say that, that a ley line uh, transformer, transmitter, or, you know, whatever was defective in a given area and so it didn't get as much and so therefore spills worked less. Um, you could say there's an overload in another. But I believe it came out of there and has since been morphed and reforged and morphed again. It, 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 was, it was terribly, terribly difficult to put your finger on, that's when it happened, back in those early years. It's very difficult. D&D um, &D was not called a role-playing game until the Dallas Egberts lost in the steam tunnels thing. And I don't know which of us came up with the wording, though it was probably, it was probably me from some telephone conversations I'd had with reporters. And so, you know, I would explain it as, well, you're playing a role. It's similar to what the psychiatrists and psychologists do in their type of role-playing. And so it became role-playing. It's the way stuff happened. We're running a two-week game. For the first time in decades, I'm actually rolling for the hit points of the monsters. So when the PC hits the orc, I roll a D8 to determine its actual hit point value. So you might get lucky and have a one or two hit point orc. Do you just use set hit point values as every orc has eight, every gun has six? Absolutely not. If, if if for some reason I generate or have to produce a band of six or seven orcs, I roll six or seven hit dice and write them down. And uh, as a given hit, hey, you know, this guy only took three to begin with and he just got hit with four. He, that one's dead. This other one gets hit with four. He's not dead yet, but he isn't looking real healthy. I, I never, I never, ever would have even considered talking about hit points during the middle of the game. Yep, it's down to six. No, 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 no. I might get more and more discredited. Oh, he's staggering. He's reeling. His eyeballs keep trying to roll up in his head. Something of that nature. But I've always, always rolled individually for monsters, and that's what you should do. 
treat those hit point numbers, eight hit points, as the maximum it can have. And it'll also tell you, gee, I can roll a D8. And if I roll a one, it's a crappy orc, and he's old, and he's phlegmy, and he's got rheumatism, and I killed him. Orcs never give up. They don't retire. Maybe you run across a group that are all subspar because you can justify it by they've got their asses handed to them in a fight earlier. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't believe I ever had maximum, all, everything all maximum hit points. I don't think. I don't know. It's late at night and a long time ago. Um... I've recently taken on stewardship of a small, old-school gaming convention in Southern California, and am in organizing for next October. Is there any facet of the early conventions you attended that stands out in your mind as setting them apart? First thing, food. Food. At the beginning, it didn't even have to be good food. This con had it, and that one didn't. It made this con better. Food. And now I might also say, to translate in that in today's, a, a good food truck, a good drink truck. And uh, that'll, that'll, give, that'll give the attendees another whole place to mingle and socialize. Especially if they're ta playing games that have a break in them which I've always done, board games or whatever, I've always had uh, a break in the middle of the game. As long as everybody a pit stop. All right, we're not planning on tournaments since we want to offer variety and expose people to older games other than D&D. &D. But I'd love to be able to channel the feeling of old conventions in some small way. I'll definitely be bringing a copy of Awful Green Things and Snit's Revenge. Heaven help the Green Things player when the five dice to kill chit comes out of the bag and the first time the fire extinguisher is used. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, that was always a horrible surprise. I don't know. Um, what struck me about early cons is whether or not they seemed organized or not. The veneer or the facade of organization goes a long way. A long way. Um, splash as many name games as you can into your advertising. I, I, liked, I liked early ones that I knew what I was going to get or what I could expect to get. Um, make sure you, of course, make sure you have name tags. It doesn't have to be the expensive lanyard around your neck. I mean, you can go old school and get the ones you stick on your shirt. Um, because name tags help the players interact with each other as well. Instead of leaning across the table, hey, fighter dude, what about if we do? You can lean across the table and say, hey, John, what if we do? Okay, the faster you can build cohesion in your players, the more fun you'll have, the farther you'll get down the road. But I really believe that having food, good food, at whatever is reasonable price at your, in your location, Southern California, I shudder to think what a Coke or a Mountain Dew might cost, but it's what you're used to, so don't don't jack it way up on your attendees. Sell to your attendees at cost if you're going to handle it yourself. Sell them to them at cost, or you know a minimal a minimal markup. Don't gouge them. If you can get a 16 ounce bottle of Dew for uh, a dollar and a nickel. Charge a buck and a half. Don't charge two dollars. The gamers think they're getting a deal, which they will be. 
That will encourage them to feel gratitude toward the convention. And that can only help, right? I would... Uh, yeah, um, if, if, you're, if you're not going to run tournaments, then make a big deal about what is available there. Um, you're still going to have to have a schedule. So, interesting. I can't ever remember being at a convention that didn't have tournaments since the first... The first, I think the first Vagarian I went to, which would have been in, ooh, so it was, it was 74. Um, there was always some kind of tournament going on. Of course, um, when I went to Gary Con in 75, I played in several miniatures games that gave trophies and stuff. I had a whole box of stuff I was walking around with by the end which helped impress Gary and Brian, uh, though I didn't know it at the time Brian, about Brian. You know, I knew, I knew Brian was there. I had no idea how much say he had. But it did impress both of them that, well, I wasn't a complete uh, blowhard. I must know a little bit. Because I, I, I think I entered three in one of them. Um, last question or comment. Was curious to know if Gary preferred being a player or the DM. Also, is there any chance I can get a blade I painted signed by you? Sure. You wrap it. You be responsible for its wrapping. Make it a wrap that I can reuse. Make it a box that I can reuse if possible. And you include the return postage which you'll know because you'll have sent it and um, sure I'll be glad to and you can at the time PM me on Facebook and uh, get, my, get my address stuff um, okay back to, back to the first question I believe that Gary preferred being the DM. However, he really, really enjoyed playing a player character because he couldn't put his DM persona away completely. So he was a, re he was a relentless player. Relentless. Asking questions and... and um, Making you, uh, making you earn your supper if you were a DM with him. Um, if you've seen some of the pictures, he's got that devilish glint in his eye. Well, he had that on all the time when he was playing. Um, he enjoyed confounding and manipulating the players. And I say this based on an extensive play test we did of um, Metamorphosis, uh, no, Gamma World. Yeah, Gamma World in the ship. And uh, the way he made us jump through hoops, playing it strictly as ignorant, you know, uneducated, hill people, uh, migrant type, you know, um, human, simple culture. He loved just loved hitting us with all the things of civilization that he would only describe. Um, but I've also seen him had a good time. Um, I, I admit that uh, he and I, we, we talked about it, I, I, I come to think of it. It's just coming, kind of, yeah. And uh, he asked me why I liked it, being a DM rather than a player. And I said, well, I hadn't had much choice at the beginning because I was the only one with the set of rules <coughs> and the dice. So um, I fell into it that way. But I, 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 well, even today, I'm, I'm most 
95, 90, 95% of what I do is running games. The only time I'm playing in them is usually for a charity event. Um, I believe that Gary and I shared one thing behind this green. I know we did because I we, we touched around it, and that was, okay, here I am with my dice. There's you six or eight or whatever. Bring it on. Bring it on. And you didn't have to do anything because I'll... All, everything was pre prearranged. I mean, the monsters were already wherever they were, and they already had their hit points assigned, and you know and all that. But it was more um, making them think really hard to find clues on where to go and which which direction to take, and um, devising things that. Well, back back in the early t early times, um, sloping floors were a big deal. Because if you didn't, if it was well done, and if you saw some of the drawings out of the old original uh, Little Round books, and I know they've been re re they were reprinted in some of the other editions just as an illustration. Some of those tunnels go a long way, at a very slight angle. And before you know it, you're a considerable number of feet below where you were when you started on that long corridor, which is why, you know, dwarves and their, their ability to detect slopes, all of a sudden they got a job nobody else can do. And then somebody figured out, well, who needs a damn smelly, stinky, obstreperous, argumentative dwarves when I can bring a box, a, a bag of marbles? And I let marbles be used um, because marbles... There are really, really old examples of marbles on our earth. So why not allow them there? I don't allow ball bearings. Every time somebody says they have a sack of ball bearings, I ask them where they got the machinery to build those. But I, I once had somebody tell me that uh, they had round shot. And I said, what do you mean you have round shot? Well... They've been making these funny lead balls all these years because somebody figured out if you dropped hot lead into a thing down there out of the church tower window, they made balls, and so we played marbles with them. Give you a good backstory, okay. Good reason, sure, okay. Um, but that's that's the fun, the one of the funs of being a DM. What? What was it? Explain to me again exactly, please explain to me exactly what it is you intend to do. Now, if that doesn't send them back on their haunches for a few seconds and think it out before they start talking, bad things often happen. But I think the fun in being a DM is making the players think, watching the, the lights come on, so to speak, lot a lot like teaching. A lot like it. And that's the last comment. And you know, when you don't comment, I have very little to talk about. What's going on? Oh, I found out, much to my chagrin, that you can only prime a lot of the resin figures with an airbrush which is, okay, I got an old one, a really old one, that was working when I put it away, so I don't reason to not to, except I put it away in pieces because I cleaned all the parts. And now i got to go online and see if I can find an instruction manual for a, uh, oh, Jesus, I must have bought that. I must have bought that in college or close to it. Somewhere between 74 and 76. 76 was in college, but it was back in then when I was uh, doing a lot of figures and and uh, used it again when I painted a lot of stuff uh, here in Cincinnati in the early to mid-80s for some of the big uh, 
battle royales that we, they had here once every year. Um, so I got to figure out that so I can prime them. And then I bought something, I bought something branded. Okay, a Dungeons and Dragons Christmas ornament. Hallmark. Then Burshad. Then Burshad. Okay, that big, fat, slimy, obese, well, not slimy, big, big obese dragon from uh, um, Group of Thieves, Gang of Thieves, the D&D movie who's grown so fat he can no longer fly. And I looked at that, and before I knew the, the character, I just looked at that big, fat dragon who obviously couldn't fly. I was in the store. And I said, this is a metaphor for D&D. &D. Because the later editions have become so bloated with rules, so obscenely cumbersome, that there's an analogy here. It's not a pleasant analogy, and I'm sure it's not one that Hasbro would like to uh, dwell on, but I believe that the game has become bloated to near unrecognizability. Much like Thimbershod. And on that pleasant note, I'll tell you all, Dodada Govi. <laughs>